Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. band and that man are on fire today. It's good. So two friends were talking. The first friend said, I just lost my job. The second friend said, oh no, tell me what happened. The first friend said, well, that man said something to me. I just couldn't work for him anymore. Well, what did he say? You're fired. <laughs> How many of you have experienced, well, maybe not that exactly, but uh, I think everybody needs to get fired from a job at least once in your life. No, just have a universal experience. I don't speak that over you, I promise. But have you ever had the experience like you're, you have a goal in life, you're going somewhere, and then life interrupts? Okay, most of us have had that, right? Today, I, I chose the talk title, Doing Our Work. What I've discovered um, in unity is that sometimes we, we want the easy, fast path to enlightenment. And I have also discovered it does not exist. <laughs> that there is no steady, subtle, uphill climb to nirvana. But that the boulders on the path are exactly what we need to reveal the truth of who we are. So we're doing our work. And where are we going? What do we want? What is it that's happening for us? Well. A lot of spiritual people might have differences of opinion, but I often go to one of the great teachers in New Thought, who is Ernest Holmes, and this is what he had. See, see, see if this resonates with you. He says, the divine plan is one of freedom. The inherent nature of man and women is ever seeking to express itself in terms of freedom, because freedom is the birthright of every soul. Can I get an amen? amen. We are meant to be free. Free in our money life, free in our relationships, free in our health and our body life. We are meant to experience freedom. We are here to take this divine idea of freedom and bring it into a human lifetime. That's what God has called us to do. When Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly, that's what we're talking about, freedom. Spiritual freedom is the very nature of, of life when we are in alignment with the truth of our being, that indwelling Christ presence. And Paul said, may the mind that was in Christ Jesus also be in you. That's what we're moving towards. That's, that's the goal. That's what we're wanting to do. And so we come into unity and we begin to 
manifest. We begin to practice this truth of our, our nature of the indwelling Christ mind, and we speak our truth, and we claim it, and we demonstrate it. It's good stuff. You can probably tell there's a chapter two coming to that, but I'm going to stop right there for a moment. Does anybody know Jabez from the Bible? Some of you know this. In 2 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles, excuse me, it's a long list of people. The kings, the leaders, the judges of Israel and their descendants. And for some reason, Jabez gets a little bit more mention in this long list of names. In verse 9 of chapter 4, it says, His mother called him Jabez, meaning that he was brought forth in pain. Maybe he got fired. He had, his name had this connotation of suffering. And yet, Jabez was able to turn it around. In, in chapter 4, verse 10, Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from the evil one. This is what we teach in unity. That there is, as we talked about, Emma Curtis Hopkins said, there is good in the universe for me and I ought to have it. This is the divine birthright that we are meant to have a bigger, more spacious, more free experience of life. And the metaphysical meaning of the three elements of that prayer. Enlarge my territory. Territory, it represents the consciousness of good and its mirrored manifestation. That when we truly know who and what we are and how blessed we are by God, we begin to demonstrate it. But it is the true, deep, embodied knowing that is our territory, our consciousness of God's good. And so when Jabez prayed, increase my territory, more good, more God. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, but the darkness goes away when you light a candle. That when you bring the truth of who you are, those problems and those barriers begin to fade away into nothingness. The second part of that prayer, he says, and may your hand be with me. Metaphysically, the hand of God represents power. The face of God represents communion, the presence. The heart of God represents kindred, loving relationship with the Almighty, with the divine. But this idea of the hand of God, I need power to make the better choices, to demonstrate the truth of my being and, and, and have the demonstration of God's good. To have that territory be enlarged and then have the power to see it made manifest. And then the third part, which is interesting, and keep me from the evil one. Now in traditional churches, they might speak about Satan, an embodiment of pure evil, the devil, the fallen angel, Lucifer. Uh, in unity, we don't teach that. What we teach instead is that the evil one is our own thought of separation from God's power. It's our mistaken thought. It is our error thinking. It is our false belief that there is something other than God in my life. That's what we are to be released from and freed from. So we do our manifestation prayer. We begin to speak and we begin to see it happen. I've been a part of this movement for 27 years. I have seen some stuff. I've done some stuff. I have been practicing... <laughs> I have been practicing and malpracticing this teaching for 27 years. And what happens a lot is people come in here and they've seen the secret or they've got an idea that we are that manifestation church, and they begin to practice principles and they see it happen. Usually the three Ps, you know these, right? Princes, palaces, and parking spaces, right? <laughs> You begin to claim your word, you write your affirmation, you speak it seven times a day for seven weeks, and then all of a sudden things start happening. And this is good. And then life may intervene. A diagnosis comes. The job is lost. The relationship ends. A child acts crazy. And it doesn't seem as easy. 
And this is the time that many people leave this church and other churches like this because they say, well, it didn't really work. Work is the key word. What's the saying in the 12 steps? It works if you... Yeah. We have work to do because our territory, we may enlarge it for a bit, but the reason we can't hold the territory is because other things are living there. Your belief in not enough. Your sense of separation from God. Your, your shame and your fear. Those, all of those, and I have, those are just my list. You can add to it as your own. But we have all of these old ideas and misunderstandings of reality that occupy our consciousness. And we cannot hold the territory unless we do the work of releasing false ideas and beliefs about us and about God and about the nature of reality. And this is not quick. Ask some of the people who have been in this church for 30, 40, 50 years practicing these principles, still doing their work. That's what we're called to today. I had this idea that I was going to do this whole message around um, the curriculum. Because, you know, in Unity, we love to think about these are soul lessons. That we come here, that these things that other people might call problems or some people call them challenges, they are lessons for my soul to learn. And I like that idea. I like that idea that we are, it's like we've signed up for a class. And the way I've come to understand it is there are three kinds of curriculum that we partake of here on planet Earth or classroom Earth. We, we have the elective curriculum. I would like to manifest a boyfriend. Okay, I'm going to take the class, so I'm going to do the manifestation. I'm going to just, there it is. That's the electives. You know those. Or a girlfriend. Or a wife or a husband. Or increase my bank account. You know, you, those things, I want this. And you elect to take that course, and you do the study, and you begin to work with it. Then there is what I call the required curriculum. Have you ever had the experience of having the same pattern of, of energetic events happen in your life, even though the circumstances are different on the outside? Have you ever had the experience of you have the same situation show up in your finances, even though you have a different job and you make a different amount of money, it shows up the same way? Sometimes for your whole life, you've been finding yourself in that same predicament again and again. This is, there's a pattern of belief, and it's in your life asking for your attention for spiritual solution. This is your required curriculum. You're not going to get away from it. And they usually show up around health, finances, or relationship. Those are usually the ways that we, these required curriculums, and they're, there's a lot of similarity, but they're, yours will be unique to you. The things that you might say you have contracted, if you believe in soul contracts, those things that you have come into this life to discover and to heal and to reveal your required curriculum. And then the third category of curriculum that I was, I'm just making this up, you know, you take it as you use it as you want, but this is what I call the universal curriculum. That there are certain lessons, there are certain things, uh, principles and dynamics and um, phenomenon that we must learn if we are going to be on a spiritual path. And it is for all of us. Things like, oh, resilience. Have you noticed that life is going to ask you to be resilient? And the longer we're on the planet, the more it's required. When you notice that your body doesn't do what it used to do, resilience is required. And I'm talking about spiritual and emotional resilience. The more relationships you're in, the crazier people act, the more you're going to need resilience. These are spiritual lessons, and we must commit to learning the spiritual practice and to showing up doing it in our lives. What about forgiveness? I love Edwin Gaines, Reverend Edwin Gaines. She's a prosperity teacher in our movement, a unity minister, who started in this church, by the way. She's kind of famous around unity. She said, uh, there's a simple test to determine whether or not you still have forgiveness work to do. Question number one, are you breathing? <laughs> if you answered question number one, yes, you still have forgiveness work to do. It's universal. 
Unless you can stand and say that I am completely at peace with every event that has ever occurred in my life up to this moment and going forward, you have forgiveness work to do. Holding unforgiveness is like drinking poison, hoping the other person dies. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend Sheila Gatro. She heard that one. It poisons our own experience of life. And it is a required course for all of us to learn to let it go, to get your foot off their neck, and mind your own business. <laughs> and the third curriculum, thank you. Take it, use it. <laughs> the third required curriculum, the universal cur curriculum, I should say, is faith. You are not going to be given a blueprint or a map outlining every step of your life to get you to your goal. That is not the way it works. There are going to be so many moments that you do not know what to do next. Faith is required for all of us. And to learn the lesson, how do you get to learn faith? You practice it. You step out in it. You test the Lord and see that He is good. I was really wanting to bring a story. I love stories. Don't you love stories? A story that would illustrate this for us. And uh, there are so many great stories from nowadays, but also from the ancient world. All the faith traditions have beautiful stories. A few weeks ago, I talked about Krishna and Arjuna on the battlefield. A beautiful story from the Hindu tradition. But there's one story in the Jewish tradition that just continues to speak to me. It's what we would, in Christianity would call the Old Testament but um, more correctly, it's called the Hebrew Bible. There's a story there that is so epic and so powerful and so universal about what freedom that I really wanted to share some of it. Now, if we're going to do the whole story, we'll be here for weeks, so I'm just going to pick one part of it. But this is the story of Moses leading the children of Israel from slavery into the land of promise. Freedom. Freedom. There are a lot of elements to the story. I'm going to skip the plagues, if that's all right with you. We're going to start after that. Well, you know the way it begins, right? And by the way, Sheila McKeithen, who is a wonderful minister in Jamaica, I really want to bring her to speak to us. Sometimes she's fabulous. I heard her speak at Michael Beckwith's conference in L.A. years ago, and she said, everybody has a call on their life, and it's either a David call or a Moses call. The David call means you get the whole thing that David was anointed as the next king of Israel when he was a boy. He knew what it was he was to do, and that was his life. Most of us do not get that. Most of us get, rather than the anointing of the oil by Samuel, we get the Moses call where God just says, I want you to go talk to Pharaoh for me. One step at a time. But Moses heard the call, the burning bush, remember? He goes down into Egypt and he talks to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And then came the refusal and the plagues and all of that. But eventually, Pharaoh relented and he let the slaves, those that he had in, uh, enslaved to be free labor to build his temples, he let them go because he was so beset by the, the wrath of God. And so Moses leads, Moses and Aaron lead the people out of Egypt, into the wilderness, and into the promised land. That just happened in a day or so, right? Where are my Bible people? Forty years. Now, early on in their wandering in the wilderness, soon after they left Egypt, they were told to camp by the Red Sea. That's the part of the story I want to talk about today. And as they are camped there by the Red Sea, Egypt behind them, the water in front of them, the Scripture says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And the people in Pharaoh's court began to speak to him. Why did you let our slaves go? Why did you do that? And so Pharaoh got on his chariot and hundreds of his charioteers and they rode for the Red Sea to the encampment of the Israelites to bring them back into slavery. And while the children of Israel are camped there, having the manna, from heaven, 
the water that comes from the stone, they are being supplied in all their needs by, by El Shaddai, the great provider that is God. They, would, they were stuck. And then all of a sudden, somebody sees the dust from the chariots coming. Now what are you going to do? God spoke to Moses. I, there are three movies that have portrayed this scene that I know of, The Prince of Egypt, The uh, Ten Commandments, and the newest one is uh, Christian Bale. It's called uh, Exodus, Gods and Kings. I watched this scene yesterday from all three versions. Even though the CGI is not very good and the Charlton Heston is the best one. <laughs> God told Moses to raise his, heart, his hand and the staff over the sea and command it be parted. And he did. He said, a great wind came from the east and parted the sea, and the children of Israel crossed in on dry land. And then what happened? When the chariots came after them, Moses lowered his hand and the water closed in upon them. What does that have to do with me? You're asking? Everything. Every one of us has been camped by that Red Sea. Every one of us has been on the road to our land of freedom and plenty. And it seems like the road runs out and there's no way forward. And in that moment, you will be given the opportunity to go back into bondage if you choose. A few years ago, I had a, I just had a ministerial school. I got an opportunity to go serve as an associate minister in Center for Spiritual Living in Reno. Happened pretty quickly. I, I was moving. I had um, rented my house out in Dallas and I... I got myself to Reno, and it had been a time of real stress and struggle and just a lot happening, and I, my exercise and eating plan had gone out the window, and so I arrived in Reno with none of my clothes fitting, and I made a decision that I'm going to get free again in my body. I'm going to stop eating sugar, and I made the decision, and I set out of Egypt for the promised land. <laughs> my very first Sunday at the Reno church... I'm hugging people. I'm getting to know people. A woman comes up and hugs me, and she gives me a pink box, and she walks away. I open that box, and I'm not kidding you. It was a giant pink sprinkled donut the size of an inner tube. It was a cake like a Homer Simpson donut given to me. And I, I talked to, there was an associate minister there, Karen, Reverend Karen Neuweiler. I said, you're not going to believe what happened. I've, been, I've made this decision. I'm going to not eat sugar. And then somebody gives me a giant pink donut. And she says, well, that's just the Egyptians coming after you. <laughs> Make no mistake. Every time you set an intention and a declaration for a different experience of life, the universe will give, the, give you the opportunity to go, are you sure? Do you really want your freedom? Or are you just talking? What do you do? You know there's a greater life that's calling for you. You can feel it in your bones. Maybe it's sobriety. Maybe it's financial freedom. Maybe it is that connected and committed partnership that you've been longing for. You know that there is more for you in this life. And you make the intention and the declaration for your freedom, and you walk towards it, and then you get to a place where you do not know the next step forward because it is blocked. I was actually going to call this talk Between the Chariot and the Deep Red Sea. <laughs> but you've been there. You might be there right now. And what do you do? Because it is a valid choice to go back into the old way of life. And you can do it, but you will be miserable. You will weep bitter tears. Been there. Or you can practice your faith. You can step out into a reality. You know, this image of Moses parting the sea, that's a powerful image. And it has, I've experienced it. I have, have you ever experienced a way being made where there was no way? One of them was the way here. This was not where I intended to be 20 years ago. If I were to put becoming a senior minister at Unity of Houston on my vision board and mapped out a plan to get here, 
no clue at all. There was no path for that. But I did step out of my faith, and I was told in no uncertain terms, not in English, but I knew I had to go to ministerial school, and I resisted it and resisted it. But I was obedient, and I was diligent. And then nine years ago, a conversation with a man named Howard Caesar. In some ways, I'm there again right now. We are on the verge of the next chapter of this wonderful church of ours. I think we're going to celebrate our 100th anniversary next year, we just decided. It's kind of vague back there. The charter of our church was actually the 1950s, but there was a group that began in 1919 or 1920 in the home of Bertha Miller. A community gathered around these teachings and began to practice and support each other. And that original community stayed intact, and they were part of that charter in the 1950s. So we have been, a, we're stepping into something, a journey that's gone on longer than 40 years, almost 100 years. And we don't know exactly the changes we need to make to attract the next generation of the young families who will come here and raise their children in unity. We don't know exactly what we're supposed to be doing next, but I have faith that God is calling us and equipping us, and we're doing this together. We're going somewhere. I had a conversation with one of our members yesterday. She's a, a deep practitioner of uh, spiritual study, and she has been in one of those camp by the Red Sea moments, and she was sharing with me her experience. I shared with her mine. And then we talked about, um, she shared with me another conversation she'd had with a friend. And the friend, I think this is on Facebook, the friend said this, if I knew where I was going, if God would tell me, I would go. But maybe God is telling me that, that if I knew where I was going, I'd screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> and, my, and Carrie, one of our member here, she said this, what if it's more like this? If you knew where you were going, you would always focus on the horizon and miss the step right in front of you. I thought maybe she should be speaking this sermon today. If I knew exactly where we're going, I might miss what's right here today. But if we and you and I stay open, and diligent, and do our work, that next step will be revealed. Make no mistake. And the next. And the next. And the next. If we will focus on the step right in front of us, on those right around us, my teacher in Dallas, Petra, she used to say it this way. When we we're in one of those stuck places, she said, just keep your nose to the wall. That was code. We all knew what that meant. Stay in class. Don't quit. Don't quit the church. Don't quit therapy. Don't quit the 12 steps. Just stay, 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 stay. And she said, what will happen is one day, if you don't go to sleep and if you don't run away, you will wake up on the other side of the wall and you'll have no idea how you got there. Stay. Don't quit. You are amazing. You are called by God to deliver a unique expression of its own nature that will never be seen in any other way unless you get freed up enough to give it. And it's needed now more than ever. Something is happening here. If no one has told you today that they love you, I love you. I love you. I want you here with me as we do this work. I don't know how good a Charlton Heston I am. <laughs> but I will stay open. 
and my act of service is to lead you where God is taking us. God bless you. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.